Now it's finally time that we put all these things together and learn how to do filtering. In this lecture, we will draw the equations for the optimal filter, which are general equations that we can use to solve any filtering problem that we will encounter in this course. We will show how we can calculate our filtering densities efficiently by making the filter updates recursively. And we will illustrate the computed densities using a simple example. But before we start, we need to properly define the filtering problem. So remember our discrete time state space models, where we have a state vector x, k, and an observation y, k. So we describe how the state evolves over time using a known motion model, like this. And how our observations relate to our state vector using a measurement model, like this. Further, we suppose that we have some prior distribution that is known to us, and that the state at time k is conditionally independent on all the previous measurements or past measurements, and that the state at time k is conditionally independent on all the past measurements and the past states if we condition on xk minus 1. All the past states here and all the past measurements here does not include any more information about xk than what the previous state does. And this equality here is what's called the Markov property. We also assume that the current measurement, yk, is conditionally independent on all other states, x0 to k minus 1, and all the past measurements if we condition on xk. So we can remove all the past states and all the past measurements in this expression here, because all the information should be summarized in the current state. So remember that a necessary condition for these to hold true is that both the motion and measurement noise processes need to be independent over time and with each other. So in this setting, the Objective in filtering is to compute the so-called filtering density, which is this posterior density of xk given observations up to and including time k. And typically we want to do this for k equal to 1, 2, 3, and so on. So, in principle, as we know Bayesian statistics, we can also find this posterior density. In a bit of a brute force approach, we can find this filtering density in two steps. First, we can use Bayes' rule to find the posterior density of the complete sequence of state vectors, so the collection of states from time 0 to time k, and this posterior density we condition on all the measurements up to time k. If we use Bayes' rule, uh, we can now flip these two, such that we get this factor here, where the density is now over the set of measurements and we condition on our state sequence. And then we have times this prior on our state sequence and we get this normalization factor here. Note that we can regard this as a normalization factor as we're interested in this as a function of our state sequence and this factor here does not depend on that. So we see that we can express this posterior density here over the state sequence as a product of our measurement models and our prior. And these are models that we all know, so we can express these. Now, as a second step, to get the filtering density, we need to marginalize the state sequence posterior with respect to all the past states. That is, the states that we are not interested in at the moment. That is, we find the filtering density and by integrating our sequence posterior over all the past states. As we see here, we can use Bayes' rule in combination with the law of total probability to calculate the filtering posterior. Although we in theory end up with the correct solution following these two steps here, in practice the complexity of the solution will grow as the state sequence here will become larger and larger. This has two implications. For one, uh, this density here will become more and more complex and will involve the multiplication of more and more factors here as k grows. Second, uh, the integration here will be uh, taken over a larger and larger space, uh, the complexity of this integral will become larger and larger. As such, it will become harder and harder to calculate this filtering density. As we typically want to calculate this um, posterior density at each time step k, we tend to want the complexity to be roughly the same at each time instance, and especially not grow over time. So the weakness with this approach is that it grows with k. Now, is there a smarter way to calculate the filtering density that does not have this weakness? But of course there is. The solution is that we calculate the filtering density recursively, where the general approach or methodology is that we want to use that we have just calculated the posterior density from the previous time instance, and we want to use this together with our conditional independence assumptions 
to calculate the new posterior at the current time. So here is an illustration that summarizes the general methodology of the recursive filtering solution. So as we assume that we have computed the posterior density from the previous time instance, that is, we have computed p of x k minus 1 given measurement up to time k minus 1. So we know this already. The next step is to take this density, which summarizes what we know about this data at time k minus 1, and predict that in time such that it says something about the state at current time. So we want to calculate this predicted density here. And we do that with a prediction step where we use our motion model. So the motion model enters here. So after the prediction, we get what is called the predicted density. So the density of the state at the current time given measurements up to the previous time instance. So this describes what we know about the current state given all the past measurements. Now we want to use this predicted density with the current observation yk to get the posterior filtering density. In order to do that, we we'll make use of our measurement model in an update step. So the measurement model enters in the update step. So once we have computed the posterior density, uh, we can compute an estimate of our current state. So we call that x hat k given measurements up to time k. And we write that like this. And we can start all over again. So making this our new prior, so we exchange this for this, and then we make this again, right? So we have a recursive solution starting from the posterior density from the previous time instance. We make a prediction, and then we make an update, and we get a new posterior density. So note that all the densities that we have computed here, they all have the same dimensionality as the state. So we have avoided that the computational complexity grows with time. So making these things here are have roughly the same complexity each time we do it. So now we seem to have something that is a bit more reasonable. The only question now is, how do you actually calculate these uh, predicted density and this posterior density here? We start by looking at the prediction step. Um, here, we want the predicted density, so the density of xk given all the past measurements, and we want to calculate this from our posterior density, so the density of xk minus 1, given all the past measurements. So in this step, we make use of our knowledge regarding our previous state, xk minus 1, that we have obtained from our previous measurements in order to predict xk, so the state at the current time. That is, we want to translate our old knowledge about our state, that is summarized in this posterior density, to describe the state at the current time using this predicted density here. As hinted previously, um, we want to use our motion model, p of xk given xk minus 1, uh, together with our posterior density from the previous time instance in order to compute the predicted density. So a useful first step is to introduce the missing variable here, which is the previous state xk minus 1. And we can do this by using the law of total probability, where we add the previous state in this expression here. So we get p of xk and xk minus 1, condition on all the past measurements. And in order for the quality here to still uh, hold true, we need to integrate out over our added previous state. So we need to integrate over xk minus 1. Now if we look at this, we can see that we can factorize this density here by splitting up these two into two densities. Well, the first is over um, xk, given xk minus 1. and all our past measurements, and then just over xk minus 1, given all our past measurements. Uh, note that we now have the posterior density from the previous time instance here, right, which we wanted. However, we also have this a bit strange looking density here, but if we look a bit more carefully at this, I hope that you can recognize it from before and remember that our current state is conditionally independent on the measurements if we condition on our previous state. So this is the Markov property of our state sequence. Now, if we use this, we see that we can remove the past measurements from this density as they do not provide any information about xk when we condition on xk minus 1. And this is because that xk minus 1 should summarize everything that we need to know about the system up to that time. By doing this, we see that this density here simply becomes our motion model. 
Now the final expression for the predicted density becomes So our motion model times our posterior density from the previous time instance and then we integrate over our previous state. And this equation here, it's called the shopman kolmogorov equation. And that is what we use in the prediction step in a recursive filter. So, to summarize, in order to compute the predicted density, we use the posterior density from the previous time instance, uh, together with our motion model, to solve the shopman kolmogorov equation to get this density. So here is a self-assessment question that you could answer by solving the equations on the previous slide, but here I would rather like you to think about it from a conceptual point of view and think about what would make more sense. So now on to the measurement update step where we want to compute the posterior density, so the density of xk given all the measurements up to k time k, using this predicted density that we just calculated in the prediction step. So in principle, what we want to do in this step is that we want to update our knowledge about xk using the new information in yk. So we go from this predicted density where we don't include yk to this posterior density where we include information from yk, the current measurement. Uh, to derive the updated posterior density, we start by separating out the current measurements from this measurement sequence here, such that we get something looking like this. We do this just to make what, what will happen in the next step a bit more clear. Uh, now in order to get out the predicted density, we can use base rule to switch places on xk and yk in this case. So if we use base rule uh, to switch xk and yk, we get the following expression. So we get the predicted density here, which we wanted. And this density here could be regarded as a constant as it does not depend on our uh, current state. Now, if we look at this factor here, we can see that we can simplify this as a likelihood function or measurement model uh, as yk is conditionally independent on all the past measurements if we also condition on xk. So we can remove this factor here from our density. Again, this is due to that everything that we need to know in order to describe the current measurement should be summarized in our current state. Uh, so if we ignore the proportionality constant, um, the updated density can be defined as proportional to this expression here. So the proportional to the likelihood times the predicted density. So in the update step of a recursive filter, we see our predicted density as our prior that we multiply by our likelihood to get our posterior density. So now we have also derived the expression for the uh, measurement update step uh, in our recursive filter, and we have expressed it in terms of our predicted density, which we have calculated in the prediction step, and our measurement model, which we assume that we know. We should note that this expression here and the expression that we derived for the predicted density are general expressions. So these expressions here are general and they provide the recursive solution to any filtering problem. We will in later parts of this course look at how we can solve these equations exactly when we have the so-called linear and Gaussian models and how we can find good approximations if we have a non-linear and non-Gaussian model. To wrap things up, I thought we look at a simple example to see what is happening in the different steps of the filter recursion and how the resulting densities look like. We will do this by considering a random walk in two dimensions where we also get position observations. And that is, we have a two-dimensional state vector, xk, which has two components, x1 and x2. We can think of this as a 2D position of some object. The motion of this object is using a motion model like this, where the current state is equal to the state at the previous time instance plus some noise, where the noise in this case here is a zero mean Gaussian with some covariance Q. 
So here we can see a realization of a random walk of this process model here, where we can interpret this basically as the state, the position of the object is basically taking a step of random length and direction at each time instance. So we are randomly walking around in this 2D environment, and hence the name random walk. And this is a fairly simple motion model, but nonetheless is important and are used in many situations. So further, at each time instance we observe the position of our object. So yk is our state plus some measurement noise, rk. And rk, our measurement noise, is again a zero mean Gaussian process with uh, some covariance r. And in addition we have some Gaussian prior of our state at time zero, which is zero mean with some covariance p0. So how does a prior, predicted density, likelihood, and updated density look for the optimal filter solution for this problem? So that's what we're going to look at now. So if we look at this for some generic time k, at the start of the recursion, we have the posterior density from the previous time instance, so we have density over xk minus 1. This gives us information that the object of interest was most likely here somewhere, right? At the previous time instance. And now we want to use this information together with our motion model uh, to predict where it would be at the current time. So we want to calculate the predicted density of xk given all the past measurements. Note that as we are doing predictions into the future and not adding any new information here, we will become more uncertain, which is illustrated by the, that this density here is wider than we had when we started here. This is also logical considering the random walk motion model, which states that the object will take a step of a random length and a random direction. And as long as we haven't received any information about which direction the object has moved, we will surely be more uncertain after doing the prediction. The next step is that we will make use of our measurement update, where we view our predicted density here. So we predict the density here as our prior, and our measurement model as our likelihood. So in this case, we get an observation that an object is here somewhere, if we're projecting down the peak here, onto the plane. The likelihood of our state would look something like this. So it says that it most probably here somewhere, but as we have measurement uncertainty, we are also uncertain about where the object is after receiving the measurement. Now, if we multiply our predicted density with our likelihood, we get something that is proportional to our updated posterior density. We can see that in this case, our measurement is fairly informative, so that the updated density is fairly close to where the observation was, which was here somewhere, right? And we are definitely further away from the predicted density, which we thought that the object was around here somewhere. We should also note that the uncertainty decreases after the update, as we have gotten new information regarding where the object is from the measurement. So to summarize, we start off with our initial prior, which is our posterior from the previous time instance. We do a prediction step to calculate our predicted density, which describes our state at the current time using all our past observations. So while doing this, our uncertainty about the object will increase, as the data that we used is getting a bit older. So we're only basing this on observations up to time k minus 1, but still describing the state at the current time. So by performing the measurement update, where we multiply the predicted density by our likelihood of the state using our observation at time k, uh, we incorporate the new information in the new observation to compute the posterior density. That is again a bit more certain about where the object is. So this is basically what is happening in the filter recursion. In future lectures, we will look into more details surrounding the mathematics around calculating these densities here for different types of state-space models. And also how we can find approximate solutions uh, to the posterior density when we cannot solve the prediction and update equations analytically.